Here in this section on painting in 17th century Italy, the authors introduce the Caracci, the brothers Agostino and Annibali, their cousin Ludovico, and the academy that they began. I want to make a point about underlining this phrase, as their re-evaluation of the high Renaissance masters attracted interest among their peers. This is telling us something critical about the Baroque. Artists like Bernini, Bernini and the Caracci were basing their artistic ideas on the achievements of the Renaissance artists who came before them in the 15th and 16th centuries. But they were also striving not only to emulate, but to reinvent the Renaissance tradition. These are critical ideas, a tradition being continued and being reinvented. That's what this amazing ceiling fresco is all about. It's about the tradition of the painted ceiling as a game of illusionism, which had been invented in Northern Italy in the 1400s. It began with a painter named Mantegna, who created an entire illusionistic world in the chamber of the Duke of Mantua. Mantegna's skill at creating the illusion of spatial recession allowed him to paint a fictitious round opening in the ceiling with a powerfully convincing stone railing, as if blurring the distinction between art and life. All of this architectural molding, this decorative stucco work, it's all paint. It looks three-dimensional. The point of this ceiling is to delight and dazzle your eye by confusing your understanding of what is painted and what is real. Michelangelo took the tradition of ceiling painting even further when he painted the Sistine ceiling for Pope Julius II. He used the tradition of painted illusionism to create a thrillingly complex arrangement of human bodies in architectural structures. Like Mantegna, he played with levels of reality, painting fictitious marble compartments with painted figures, painted sculptures in that, carved into that fictional marble, and nudes known as ignudi in Italian. They don't serve the narrative, which is based, the main narrative is based on the biblical stories of Genesis. These well-muscled men turning and twisting are much more pagan and erotic in their Greco-Roman style. The point is that Mantegna and Michelangelo's example fed Caracci's imagination when it came time to compose, to envision and realize the Farnese gallery ceiling. So the textbook authors say, Annabelle combines the great northern Italian tradition of ceiling paintings seen in the work of Mantegna and Correggio with his study of central Italian Renaissance painters and the classical heritage of Rome. The central Italian Renaissance painters they're thinking of particularly are those working around Rome, especially Michelangelo. And so when they go on to talk about what Carace did with those precedents, those examples he was drawing from, note their points. Painted imitations of gold-framed easel paintings called quadri riportati, transported paintings, appear to rest on the actual cornice of the vault and overlay painted bronze medallions that are flanked in turn by realistically colored ignudi dramatically lit from below. They are dissecting how Caracci sets up a game of illusion. The joke is that we get paintings of paintings, a painting, a fresco, ceiling of paintings. And those pretend paintings fool our eyes that they're real paintings because the artist uses light and shadow to make them seem to rest on the cornice this real marble architectural structure. So once again, a play of the fictional and the real, art and life. Not a real frame, but looks incredibly like it. So it's a game with hyper-illusionism.
And of course, in these nude figures and seemingly carved nude sculpted relief figures, of Karachi is very much quoting, paying homage to, and borrowing from Michelangelo. And so we have to understand artists as working with traditions, adding to and developing traditions. This concept of tradition is central to our project in this class because we are looking at how art traditions develop and then change are continued and are undermined. And eventually we'll get to the point where there's a questioning of tradition itself. But most of all, tradition is fundamental to human societies. societies. Human societies build traditions as the glue between the past, present, and future, connecting generations across time. So in art, we're thinking about the passing down of the elements of an artistic culture from the Renaissance to the Baroque, this is the passing down of illusionism and other ideas and ways of proceeding. A mode of thought or behavior followed by a people continuously from generation to generation. So how artists are trained, how artists proceed, this is going to be very important because we will see this being passed on, but also being revolted against. And this idea of a coherent body of precedence that's exactly what I've been showing you with Karachi's ceiling, that he had a coherent body of paintings from Mantegna to Michelangelo to draw on to influence him. The authors put it well when they say that the Karachi felt both inspiration and competition from artists before them. Certainly they felt that with Michelangelo, admiration, envy, desire to honor his example and to go beyond it. But as the authors say, not only from Michelangelo who lived in the 1500s, but from the artists who lived in the ancient time of Greece and Rome, because the Farnese had an important collection of ancient sculpture exhibited throughout the palace. Tradition is about how artists respond to the past how they make use of it. In the Renaissance and Baroque, artists were responding to the immediate past, but also to the distant past. This was true for Michelangelo as well, whose vision of the Sistine ceiling was deeply influenced by this sculpture from around 200 BCE, which was literally excavated in a farmer's field while he was beginning work on this ceiling. This famous sculpture gave him this vision of twisting, snaking forms that he carried forward to enhance the dynamism of his painting. So new art is often a response to a response to the past, as we see with Bernini, who takes the sculptural dynamism that Michelangelo got from the Laocoon sculpture from the deep past of ancient Rome, and he carries it even further carving a depiction of the story of Persephone, daughter of the Greco-Roman goddess Ceres, a kind of a mother of the grain of the earth. And Persephone is being abducted by Hades, where he will steal her, assault her, and take her down to the underworld. And the sense of motion, the sense that, they're, that the action is actually happening is so powerful, along with that illusionism we talked about, where the hands seem to be gripping into the skin as Persephone flails and struggles against this god who is overpowering her to violate her. So it's interesting that this story comes from Ovid's Metamorphosis, which is the source of the stories in the Farnese gallery ceilings. And they are very much about sort of the pagan vision of the gods as sexual, as aggressive, as violating and destructive, very different from the Judeo-Christian Islamic vision of a deity. So it's interesting to think about how the Renaissance and Baroque held these very contradictory cultural traditions in a rich mixture.